Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today we're going to be talking about why everybody should be Catholic and not just Christian. That's right. We're joined by the very gifted Father Gregory Pine to talk about why Catholicism, of all the choices a Christian can have, is the right choice. I mean, one opinion that I have is there ain't no party like a Catholic party because the Catholic, Catholic party, party don't, don't stop. stop. What? Uh. <laughs> Let the party commence. Father Gregory Pine, OP. Welcome to the show, my man. Hey, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> you know, it's true. We are a liturgical people, but we are a people of celebration. We have solemnities, feast days, memorials. I mean, we know how to do it well, and we've been doing it for a long time. That's right. That's right. Uh, Father Gregory, uh, like you mentioned, is with the Dominicans. Uh, order of preachers, and you know, to talk about why being specifically Catholic today, and not just Christian, because so many people will say, "Well, I've read Scripture, and I am a scriptural Christian, or I'm a Lutheran, or I'm a Methodist, or you know, a Mennonite, or a Orthodox, whatever it is." But we as Catholics truly do believe that the Catholic Church is the church that our Lord founded upon the rock of St. Peter. It is the body of Christ, and we implore those who are not members of it to reconnect to the branch, to the body of Christ. And it's important to us. It's not because we want to win and because we want to be right. It's because we truly believe that the Catholic Church has the fullness of the revelation of Jesus Christ and is the safest and surest bet to adhere to the bark of St. Peter on, on your journey to salvation. So it's not a competition. This is more about looking at it logically, historically, and, you know. At the root our, of what Jesus yeah, wants. Like, that's right. He just wants us to be one, mm -hmm. you know, down to the core of it, mm -hmm. you know. And But there are, like, so many religious communities out there. And, and for, I think, just nominal Catholics, but also non-Catholics especially, you know, it, it could be just a, you know, a mystery of, like, so there's different religious orders and, and congregations and rites. So can you give a little introduction to those who may not know what an OP is or, or a Dominican? Sure. Yeah. Um, so we're Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, OP stands for, like you said, the Order of Preachers, and it was, so it's a religious order, like the Benedictines are a religious order, kind of, some Benedictines might quibble with that, <laughs> um, or the Cistercians or the Trappists, you know, you got monks, and then you've got friars, so people know the Franciscans, uh, Dominicans are like Franciscans with a different emphasis, um, and it was founded, the Dominican Order, that is, was founded in the 13th century by you guessed it, St. Dominic. Didn't see that coming. Um, and St. Dominic previously had been part of another religious congregation, and then he took a little travel, a little travel. He traveled a bit through southern France. He, he encountered a heresy there called the Albigensian heresy, which was like an oldie-timey heresy, but with new bad things. And one of the main problematic teachings was that like the material world was bad. So there was like a second creative principle who was evil, who made material things. And uh, God kind of gave him a long leash and things got weird. So uh, St. Dominic founded an order of learned preachers to teach and to preach, uh, but specifically to do so in a doctrinal way to exposit the mysteries of the faith uh, and the rudiments of Christian perfection so as to lead the aforementioned heretics back into the fullness of communion. And I don't know if you've met an Albigensian recently, so I feel like we were pretty successful. So that is an occasion <laughs> for some auto back pedery. Uh, and then we've done other things since then, dot, dot, dot. Here we are in 2023. So it's still around. There's a, there's a short history. That is the best explanation of what a Dominican is I think I've ever heard <laughs> one of my favorite one of my favorite jokes is that a Jesuit a Franciscan and a Dominican are sitting around and they're saying I think God loves our order the most and they know God loves our order the most so they write a letter they send it to the Vatican to be forwarded directly to God and get you know a definitive answer and they wait a few months and they're back and three months later they're having lunch and they're still having this argument and the letter gets delivered they're like oh our letter got answered from God so they open it up 
It says, my children, I love all of my religious orders the same. And it was signed by God OP. <laughs> savage. Absolutely sad. You know, you joke. But here's the thing. When St. Thomas Aquinas describes, <laughs> I love this. Ah, oh, it just kills me. When he describes the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, he asks the type of life that he chose to assume. He's like, did he, you know, shun the company of men? like a monk. He's like, no, he did not. He's like, did he immerse himself in things active? He's like, like a modern religious. No, he did not. Did he embrace a kind of contemplative life with an apostolic focus? He did. And then you flip a couple pages later. He's like, now let me describe the best religious order, the Dominican. And you're like, wow, this sounds remarkably similar. You mean to tell me. You mean to, Jesus didn't found the Catholic church. He founded the Dominican order. Fascinating. So, bold strategy. <laughs> I love it. So let's get into the topic about, you know, you know, we just mentioned that our Lord did found the Catholic Church. And this is a question I think in our modern age, there's so much kind of, I don't know, apathy towards, well, look, as long as I'm a good person and I can go to a non-denominational church and, you know, I do what the Bible says. And those things are very kind of antithetical to what we as Catholics view in the unity focused on the person in the pair of, of the Pope in the chair of St. Peter and the unity that Christ asked for that we may all be one. So, Father, why should somebody be Catholic and not Christian? What are some of these reasons? Yeah, I think um, so I'm a big, well, I like motivating questions. That's to say, I like clearing my throat for the first half of every podcast episode. So that way, when people arrive at the point of complete exhaustion, I can insert one small answer and then just go straight to the end. Um, but I think that like people experience this question existentially in different ways. I think there's a lot of just kind of fatigue with what people perceive to be Catholic confusion. On the one hand, you, you do hear quite a few folks uh, inquiring into orthodoxy for that reason. So, so there's that kind of tendency on the one hand. I live in Switzerland at present. Uh, I'm scheduled to come back to the United States in June. Uh, but I've experienced something of the hyper-secularized European environment and also the way that the ecumenical movement um, takes shape in this environment. And that's that's another perspective, I think, from which to approach it because it's the one that I'm immersed in and I'm thinking about it more. I suppose that kind of that kind of leads in. What you'll often hear is that, you know, you got good stuff in Catholicism, but you've also got good stuff elsewhere. And then people will say, we don't want to fail to affirm what is good outside of the church. So we should just be content for them to be outside of the church. And, um, you know, people will go to such an extent as to say, you know, the means that they adopt in whatever, you know, Protestant ecclesial communion or, you know, Judaism, Islam, beyond that, Hinduism is the, the chosen means for them to attain to the knowledge and love of God. So rather than be violent and like the types of thing that you mentioned at the outset, like colonialistic or imperialistic and try to draw all things to ourselves because we're just one big egomaniacal Borg. Um, let's just, let's just let it ride, you know, and let's just say nice things about them, which confuse everyone under the sun. Um, and I, yeah, the more and more that I talk to folks about it, you can see a growing discomfort with that. And especially because, uh, you know, after the pandemic, uh, you know, people just haven't come back to church. So it just seems less and less tenable. Like you can't just affirm the secular world until such time as it saves itself. Like that's just not, it's just not, <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> Woo! it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, so I think that people are at this stage of the game desirous to hear you know, good arguments, but more than good arguments, like good preaching, good teaching, which exposits for them, you know, the richness, which lies in store were they to journey their way to the Catholic faith. Um, and yeah, maybe, I don't know, to send it back to you all. I think the big, the big categories are the integrity of the faith, the fullness of the sacramental life, and then the clarity of, you know, ecclesiastical governance, like you mentioned, um, the office, the, the primacy, and then the infallibility of that, uh, you know, the successors to, to St. Peter. So I think those are where like a lot of the arguments are going to end up falling. Delacrosse, you know, you've, you've um, interacted <laughs> with a lot of non-Catholics and you've seen a lot of inroads in relationship to people becoming Catholic and walking with them on the journey through RCIA. You know, <clears throat> what are some of the contextual things that, that you've experienced spontaneously as beautifully spontaneous as you are charismatically that that you've seen appeal to other people and recognizing like, yeah, we all should be Catholic and, and we all should kind of uh, yeah. draw close to this mystery in this church. Um, I, I think contextually it's 
um, it's the grace of God working in them and that I it, am just a witness of that, right? It's, it's, um, <clears throat> it's different for everybody. And, um, the, you know, in one case, you know, we had Jeff being drawn in from the liturgy, right. <clears throat> um, and forgiveness, right. Th- these, um, yeah, yeah, mercy simple, was big for yeah, simple for teachings Jeff. of the church. Um, and then for, for others, it's, uh, a lot of life circumstances, a lot of, uh, frustration, anxiety, um, and a need for that. And just knowing that I'm a Catholic and being present in their lives that, that they're, they're just drawn to what, what is it that makes you joyful? You mm-hmm. know, how do you have and obtain peace, uh, through your faith? Um, then others, it, it's more, uh, more coincidental, uh, you know, like our, our chefs in, um, Bozeman for our, our expedition, big shout out to estoveerexpeditions.com, <laughs> um, that it was just being before our Lord in the Eucharist and feeling loved for the first time from God, like mm-hmm. in a way that just broke down a lot of barriers in the, in the heart. So, you know, this richness that we're talking about of the faith, this integrity of the faith, right, should should be present in all of our hearts, mm-hmm. right? It should be something that we're confident in. Um, and, you know, being from Jacksonville, Florida, which is, you know, other side of the world from Switzerland, I can imagine <laughs> it's not hyper secularized, mm-hmm. it's hyper evangelical. Mm-hmm. And to be honest with you, I, you know, I, I came back to the faith through a Eucharistic conversion, so Jesus in the Eucharist was a, a really big thing to me. It's like, I can't find him in other places. This is, this is where he decided to reside in the gift that he gave us of himself on the cross. It, he continually gives mm-hmm. himself to mm-hmm. us in this way. How, and why should, I, why should I argue with that? Right? Yeah, like it's yeah. like, it, it's, so a lot of these Protestant churches in Jacksonville, you know, it's like, hey, Hi, I'm Ryan. Hi, I'm John. Where do you go to church? Yeah. Like that's literally like the next thing that yeah. they say to you, and it, it's it does so... happen a lot. Yeah, you know, you mentioned something about finding Christ in the Eucharist, and I think, and Father Gregory, you mentioned this as well. Mm-hmm. That one of the primary reasons, if we were kind of being ordered and listing them, is that the Catholic Church has the fullness of sacrament of the sacraments within her. Mm-hmm. You can go to other, you can go to a denomination, and they do not have clear sacraments as mandated by our Lord, the seven sacraments. Father Gregory, would you talk about how the church has and contains within her the fullness of sacramental um, theology where and how that's lacking in other, uh, in, in denominations outside of the church? Yeah. Um, right. So we use sacrament as a kind of generic term to describe a sign of a sacred thing that makes men holy. Typically, when we talk about the sacraments that we're talking about, specifically the seven sacraments, uh, so three sacraments of initiation, two sacraments of healing, and then two sacraments of ecclesial life, for lack of a better description. And you have those seven sacraments in Catholicism, and you have them in Orthodoxy. Uh, but when you get to Protestant ecclesial communions, um, you don't. So you, you, you often have baptism, and you'll often have marriage, but you don't have ordination, and you don't have the Eucharist. Uh, You have sometimes high Eucharistic theologies, but the Eucharist is not a spectrum. Uh, It's kind of an on-off switch. You have to intend what the church intends in order to confect the Eucharist, and you, referring there, uh, has to be a validly ordained priest, so there has to be an integrity of faith in the ordination itself. So the man has to approach with, you know, this intention according to the ordained right or the prescribed right. Um, so, yeah, we have uh, a certainty that in the Catholic life, we have the fullness of the means which conduct us onto spiritual flourishing. St. Thomas uses this cool analogy between the seven sacraments and then kind of seven stages, as it were, in our formation as human beings, like a kind of supernatural, natural parallel. And so just as we are born in the natural order and healed in the natural order, and made unto perfect age in the natural order and nourished in the natural order. So too, we are, I mean, it's a loose analogy, so it's not exactly one-to-one, but 
uh, we're baptized in the supernatural order. We receive the sacrament of penance when we fall in sin. Uh, we're confirmed and made unto perfect age as spiritual soldiers, you know, and then we're nourished in the sacrament of the Eucharist, dot, dot, dot. You can extend that through the logic. Um, so there's a kind of argument that can be made if one wants to make it that we, we can find these things in sacred scripture. We can see how they're instituted by Christ. We can see how they're subsequently communi communicated through the church's tradition. And there are just like, there are a lot of arguments that point in that direction. There are a lot of confirming signs. Um, and then there's a kind of logic at work in the sacramental life that when you give yourself to it has its effect on you. Like a lot of people can't explain the fact that when they spend time in front of the blessed sacrament, things just kind of make sense. Um, how else do you account for the fact that I had a problem and then I went to adoration? And it's not as if the problem were solved, but it's as if the problem were filled with the presence of someone else who cared about it more than I did, right? And cared about me in the midst thereof. Um, so yeah, there's a great consolation. There's a great solace that comes from that on an experiential level, but you know, the church has chops, right? So she can, she can make arguments. She can marshal reasons in defense of her sacramental dispensation. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm curious a little bit more on the integrity of faith. So, you know, when you talk about the integrity of faith, you referenced, you know, valid ordination, you're, you're touching on the fact that, you know, Jesus has instituted, we can draw from the scriptural deposit, this institution of these seven sacraments, and that there is a upholding of these, this sacramental way of life uh, throughout the rich tradition of the Catholic Church from that apostolic age. So can you speak a little bit more deeply and expound on integrity of faith and, and what that means? Yeah, I can. Um, I'm thinking about, well, whatever. I've been thinking about this recently. It's funny when people say, I've thought a lot about this. My first thought is, I don't care. Um, I don't care about <laughs> a lot. I care about well. Um, so I hope I've thought well about this, but hard to determine. <clears throat> so the, you know, you can think about creedal statements as a proposition, or excuse me, as a propositional presentation of what we believe. Obviously, it's not exhaustive, but you think about the, the Niceno Constant, Penalitan, Baba Daba Daba Da. Yep, adjectival form, creed. Um, <laughs> when St. Thomas reads that, for instance, he says you've got 14 propositions. He says seven of them pertain to the triune God, and seven of them pertain to the incarnate Lord. And he says, let's say, for instance, that you hold to 13 of them but you don't hold to one of them. You're like, ah, resurrection of the dead sounds a little bit like science fiction to me. I'm going to opt out of that one. He says, on account of that choice, you don't actually hold any of them by faith. You hold 13 by opinion, and then you demur from holding the other one. So what does that mean? Okay, when we believe, we believe on the basis of testimony. We believe because God speaks and makes us capable of receiving that speech and of consenting to it. So there's a volitional component too. We choose, right? We consent to what it is that God reveals. Um, but it's not as if you you fall into faith or fall out of faith in the way in which you fall into love and fall out of love. It's a, it's something that engages you on a human level, and it's a it's a fully human act, even while it goes beyond the merely human. And so God reveals himself in an articulatable way. I'm just going to keep up like this whole word invention process until somebody checks me on it. Um, and and the, the, the good news is that that actually mediates our contact with the realities. OK, we believe that God is who he says he is, and that gives us living contact to the realities themselves. So like when St. Thomas, for instance, talks about the mysteries of the life of Christ, he says they, they they're still operative in our lives. They're applied to us spiritually by faith and corporeally by sacraments. Like we have living contact with the life of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh. And so he says, basically, you know, you got these two categories, things that pertain to the triune God and things that pertain to the incarnate Lord. He says, you have them um, kind of summarized in one verse of scripture, Hebrews eleven six. In effect, God rewards those who believes that he exists. And, you know, uh, I always butcher this verse, so I'm just going to uh, stammer for a second while clicking on my desktop Bible and go down to Hebrews, which is already purpled out because I've clicked on it recently on account of the fact that I never recall this verse. All right, so, uh, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. Forever will draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So he, is, he associates God's existence with the triune God, that he rewards those who seek him with the incarnate Lord. And he says, this is what is offered to us in the relationship, which is mediated by God's testimony, which is most certain on account of the fact that he is the only one competent to speak to us of, you know, the hereafter of these supernatural realities, which transcend our human experience. 
So the integrity issues from the fact that God is trustworthy and that God reveals himself in ways that are recognizable and receivable to us as human beings. But then we can still, again, martial arguments. We can point to ways in which what the Catholic Church teaches is at least coherent or illumines the human condition or actually overlaps with the types of things that we can prove by rational arguments, like, for instance, the existence of God, dot, dot, dot. So, yeah, when I talk about the integrity of faith, we're not talking about cafeteria Catholicism. I pick these things because they comport with my sensibilities as to how the supernatural life should go. You know, five chakras, six chakras, maybe seven. Now, who gives a rip? What I'm interested in is God speaking and then us obeying. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the most effective, I think, and this was one that was really important to my wife when she was converting, um, arguments for the, the truth of the Catholic Church being the one true church that Christ founded was the concept of apostolic succession, that the authority of Christ as a second person of the Trinity and granted to the apostles continues to exist to this day in the bishops of the Catholic Church. And no other faith, maybe besides the Orthodox, well, the, well, the Orthodox can claim this too, but can really point and say, we have a direct continuity to the authority of Christ uninterrupted throughout all of history. You look at, you know, this Baptist convention founded by this preacher who just decided to in this year, and you'll have, you know, the Mormons, they said, well, I, you know, opened up a hat in 1820s and boom, new religion. Or you can look at the Anglicans and you can see a clear division and a lack of that um, or, or a, a schism, a break of that succession. So I think that one, to a lot of people, when you look at it historically, says there's a lot of weight to that because it's like, okay, this is the one Jesus founded. Now, do I still hold to it is another thing, but I think as a proof of at least its divine institution, that's a really powerful argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> same with uh, <clears throat> Scripture, too. You know, a lot of these, our Protestant brothers and sisters, uh, you know, use Scripture in their whatever it is that they're doing, whether, the soul it's liturgical, yeah. whether it's liturgical, whether it's, you know, the bands and the, the preacher with the skinny jeans and all that. So you're going to have them using this scripture. And like he was saying, the integrity of faith is, I believe, I believe that God is speaking to me through this scripture, through this pastor. Right. And so that's their integrity. But the, the sort of the contextual side of it is that they're using scriptures that were literally put together and and upheld and maintained for centuries by monks and you know throughout history until the printing press came and then all of a sudden became widely avail widely available to people and so a lot of people i see in sort of that that framework because I'm, I'm born and raised in a protestant area and i've seen a lot of conversions to mm. the faith a lot of it came through the scriptural um, identity of our church, yep. right, and that and that our brothers and sisters uh, in Christ are using these, and and you know, I think any Protestant who looks at even the canon of the Bible gives at least some assent to the authority of the Catholic Church because it was the Catholic Church that established the canon Without of the their Bible. Understanding, so right. th there's a yeah. lack of integrity there. That's what I'm trying you to know, say. Is like it's not. Yeah, it's it's implied fully integral. It's implied verbal. Permission, not express written permission. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to use the MLB analogy. Uh, Father Gregory, what would you say about those things? So, number one, the fact that the Catholic Church was the custodian of Scripture and established the canon, and then also, I think, which flows from that is that apostolic succession and that unbroken lineage. Um, I think a lot of things. <laughs> uh, apropos of Scripture, I mean, I guess we're just at the cut loose part of the show. So <laughs> this is a Catholic here. talk show, Father. Cut loose all you want. <laughs> That's awesome. I guess I guess I live too safe of an existence. Maybe I maybe I should cut loose more often. Um, I uh, yes. Yeah, so oftentimes you'll hear Protestants go back to the Masoretic text, which was as it were an established Jewish canon. Uh, Dr. Brand Petrie is really good on this. The Jews don't really establish a canon until the ninth century, it seems, based on his research. Uh, and the Catholic Church, while its canon is only defined solemnly in an ecumenical council in the 16th century at Trent, 
had already effectively established its canon liturgically, like by the late third century. And then by way of official promulgations in the fourth century, it just doesn't have the same weight as an ecumenical council. So you find it in St. Augustine's De Doctrina Christiana, the 73 books that you and I read, and you have it in St. Athanasius' Easter pastoral letter, and you have it in the Council of Rome convened by Pope Damasus I in 382. So this idea of canonicity is something, you know, it's a fruit of the tradition. Uh, there's no self-interpreting texts, so too there are no self-closing canons. So you need a church established in authority in order to render a canon. And when you look at Martin Luther, unfortunately for him, he recorded his thoughts as to why he wanted certain things in and certain things out. And it was on the basis of doctrinal reasons. So like the example that I gave about opinion rather than faith, when you choose something because it comports with your sensibilities as to what should be the case, then you're not believing, you're doing something else, you're inventing. And so when he chooses to exclude first and second Maccabees, it has a, a, a real relationship with his belief about the non-existence of purgatory or his lack of belief in the existence of purgatory. He was actually arguing for the exclusion of the letter of James, which is in the New Testament, all right, which which really shakes up a lot of people's narrative about this whole experience, you know, the deuterocanonical books, as it were, uh, because they're not in the Masoretic text. But uh, yeah, dot, 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 yada, yada, that's and such. So yes, I think the important part is that God reveals that he gives us the capacity to receive that revelation and that we can subsequently marshal arguments as to why it is that we believe this thing, but at the heart of the matter is faith. Uh, but then when it comes to apostolic succession, I think they're just the scandalous fact that our Lord chose this and that and not otherwise. Uh, so like, why did he choose to be born in the first century and what is currently, you know, Israel, Palestine? Uh, why did he choose to be born of this woman and, you know, who was betrothed to this man? And why did he choose to institute these sacraments according to these particular signs? I mean, you, you can search the depths of the divine wisdom and say, hey, that makes sense. Like, it's cool that he chose bread and wine because bread and wine are signs of common fellowship or table fellowship and nourishment. And so it makes sense that we would be nourished in the spiritual life by signs of physical nourishment, dot, dot, dot. But at the end of the day, we're bound by the choice that he made. You see that especially too in, in you know, male ordination. You know, the fathers of the church and medieval theologians will make arguments as to, um, you know, like certain differences between men and women and why it comports better with, you um, men that is ordination why it comports better with men but at the end of the day we're just we're bound by the lord's choice and when it comes to apostolic succession you see the fact the terrible fact that he chose these men and that these men subsequently ordained these men and on down the line up and through the present that the incarnation works its logic out in every element um you know of the catholic faith because it's not science fiction. It's not just, I'm going to dream up something that's pretty, and then I'm going to institute according to my whim. Uh-uh. We're bound by his choice, and his choice is very concrete and particular effects, which flow from his sacred humanity, which is this and that and not otherwise. So I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's just pretty interesting because I'm seeing, you know, just the next generation. Like I can identify five people in my parish right now that it's stirring within them this discernment of priesthood. You know, I'm, I'm seeing the diaconia. Like I have about six guys who are discerning uh, the diaconate way of life. And it's just interesting to see how that succession and what I loved, what, what Father Gregory was just expressing is just this, you know, the terrible choice of like the, of the apostles, <laughs> but then you know, like that these apostles then ordain that next generation, and it's a very visible and discernible and traceable lineage. And you know, just even being just an ordinary parish priest, just in, in a local neighborhood, seeing how the spirit is drawing. And when you were describing your ministry, Delacross, it's like this kind of magnetic aspect of be, people being drawn to yeah. the Lord. And when they encounter Christ in respect to the Eucharist, the source and summit of the faith, it's like, that's all, that's all they need. Like when, when you do youth ministry, it's like, if, if your kids come to that encounter, like I've got a ton of high schooler kids here after that encounter, I mean, they're all in peer ministry. They're reaching out to the next generation. They're with the seventh and eighth graders and, and they're bridging this, the fratres pontifices, like they're, they're building bridges and, and it's just awesome to see that. And it gives such an assurance that what Jesus, you know, expresses in that ut unum sent that we would be one is really being expressed charismatically in the power of the Holy Spirit among us, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and it's happening. 
I, I think um, kind of building on that and looking at the witness of what people experience when they experience Christ is one of the other really great arguments for why you should be Catholic and not Christian. If you look at the response of the first generations of Christians, of both the, in the apostolic age of the apostles and those who directly knew the apostles, and you read those writings, things like Ignatius or Polycarp, or you read the Didache, any of these early documents, and the first works of the church are like the epistles of Clement, they are shockingly and unequivocally Catholic. And you can look at these and say, okay, you know, as Father Gregory said, okay, Jesus made the choices he made, and we have no real grounds to argue with it or choose it. Either we believe in faith those, or we're just being preferential. But if you look at the response of the people who knew the people who knew Jesus, okay, I think that's a powerful argument to say this is not an interpretation. This is the actual right. lived out experience of witnessing Christ and ministering in his authority. You're you're tying something very important, and I think it's something that Bishop Polmeyer, my bishop, has has expressed too. A lot of people, especially of different denominations or or certainly agnostic or people who did not grow up like we've grown up in the Catholic faith, we're familiar with the terminology. So Eucharist is Jesus. You know, like all of these things that like unequivocally, like you were describing, like for us, sometimes, you know, the language doesn't get in the way. It's not a barrier. Mm -hmm. But the word Catholic can be a barrier sometimes, Father Gregory. You know, like the, the word Eucharist can be a barrier for some because it is so foreign. So I've heard time and time again, you know, I'm Christian. I'm not Catholic. I want to be associated with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So I am Christian. I'm not going to be Catholic. Can you comment a little bit about on that? So a couple thoughts are... I once had a conversation with a guy I got off the Metro of Congress Heights and I was walking to my parish assignment, Our Lady of the Assumption in Southeast DC. And uh, yeah, one thing on which he was hung up was the fact that the word Catholic isn't in the sacred scriptures. And you can do any number of argumentative maneuvers on that. I mean, the word Trinity isn't in the sacred scriptures. Um, and yet, I think it's important, like you said, to recognize the obstacle which is sometimes posed by the vocabulary, but not only the vocabulary, the grammar. Um, and I think that this gives us occasion to just be very core in our proclamation of the faith, like very charismatic and very catechetical, um, which is to say not condescending uh, or patronizing, but just generous in our proclamation of the faith. Because I think that what people want is an encounter with God. And what we are capable of is mediating an encounter with God. We're not here just to give them little facts or you know, like little trivia about the Catholic Church and be like, ah, yes, I see your argument and I counter with my own as if it were, I don't know, some strange game of, what am I thinking of right now? Pokemon, you know, he brings out his Charizard and you bring out your Bulbasaur. Um, so, no, it's not, it's not like that, right? You have the opportunity to actually testify to, you know, someone whom you've seen. I think about um, John 1 and you have John the Baptist is there. Our Lord passes by. He says, behold, the Lamb of God. And then Andrew and an unnamed disciple are waiting in the wings. They follow after Jesus. He turns and says, what do you seek? They say, Master, where are you staying? He says, come and see. So like that first encounter is is premised upon, upon a desire to be with him. And from that encounter comes a certainty because when Andrew comes back to his brother Peter, he just says, we have found the Messiah. Without vacillation or hesitation, he just says, boom, we have found the Messiah. And I think that um, yeah, in our preaching and in our teaching, we can testify with a similar conviction, not that we're like ginning up the courage to be like the Apostle Peter, so that way we can be, whatever, crucified on an X-shaped cross or upside, yeah, X-shaped, yeah, uh-huh. Um, Andrew X, so, Peter upside down. Andrew X, nice, it sounds like his wrestler <laughs> name. Um, <laughs> you know, we're seeking to meet the same Lord and then have that encounter transfigure us, you know, transform us such that when we turn to our neighbor, it's as if Moses just descended the mountain and he has to veil his face for the glory that shines thereon. Um, and so I think that, yeah, you're right. We, we needn't pose unnecessary obstacles to this proclamation. But the way that a lot of people take that statement is they'll say, yeah, so denominations, they're an obstacle. And it's at that point where we say, crazy town. No, because if you have the fullness of faith, of sacraments, of governance, then you want other people to partake of that banquet. It's like you look out there and they've been subsisting on fast food for the past 25 years. And it's like an episode of Supersize Me. Are they still alive? Yes, but I wouldn't describe them as healthy. So it's like, come, come to the feast of heaven and earth here at the table of plenty 
Um, <laughs> uh, William Shatner. That's a horrible song. You know of that it. spoken word. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. That's bad. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's I'm serious. You know, it's it, like, that's the type of conviction which should inform our, our proclamation. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't think we've ever had a guest who's actually beaten at us at our own game of making us laugh. Yeah, I love it, man. That's fantastic. <laughs> oh man. You know, another stumbling block that a lot of people have to being Catholic, and this is kind of more of an objection, but I think it's a primary reason also to be Catholic, is our veneration of Our Lady and the Saints. And that's a big stumbling block for a lot of non-Catholics. They're like, well, where in the Bible does it say to pray to saints? And where in the Bible does it say that, you know, you should pray to Mary or Mary, you treat her like a goddess and this and that. Um, but I think there's a lot of reasons that Catholic do it. And they are witness to how the apostles lived. They are uh, biblical and scriptural, but it's a stumbling block to a lot of non-Catholics. Uh, Father Gregory, what would you say about those things? Yeah, I, I have particular thoughts, and they're largely informed by a 19th century American apologist named Arrestus Brownson, um, who came a little bit before G.K. Chesterton. He has a similar literary whimsy, uh, but a great defender of the faith. And he wrote this book, which has been republished by Sophia Institute Press and in classic Sophia Institute Press. They've renamed it 16 different titles over the course of the past 30 years. Um, and most recently, I think it's called saint worship, but he makes the argument that with Protestantism, when you push back against the sacrifice of the mass, that you effectively flatten worship. And then when you flatten worship, you can accommodate both God and not God. So originally as Catholics, we believe that there's room for kind of two modes of worship. If the word worship makes you feel uncomfortable, like two modes of appealing to you know, God and those whom he has made holy. So we reserve for God um, adoration, sacrifice. You know, we only ask God to have mercy on us. There's certain things in our worship that are particular because God is our creator and our end. And so the sacrifice of the mass, for instance, you know, it's offered to the father by the son in the Holy Spirit. And then we have another form of worship. Again, the word makes you uncomfortable. Just do away with it. Not a big deal, uh, which we would call veneration. And that would be the type of respect that you show to another on account of the fact that God has done something glorious in him or her. And then you might appeal for the person's prayers because that person might be effective in bringing about the answer uh, according to God's generous providence. Uh, so you've got Greek words for this and you've got Latin words for this. I think some people will know the Greek words latria and dulia, which kind of get transposed into Latin. And, but but when you lose the sacrifice to the mass in Protestantism, you start to flatten worship. And so everything kind of starts to look the same. And so Protestants will feel uncomfortable uh, performing the same or similar types of acts vis-a-vis -vis God and vis-a-vis -vis the saints. But when you appeal to their sensibilities about asking people for their intercession or, you know, just entrusting prayer intentions to a living human being, it begins to make a little more sense. So I think for us, uh, a, a way forward is to insist on sacrifice, which is due to God alone, and the distinction of worship, which is offered to the Most High God. Because I think that that really does correspond with people's sensibilities. They realize that there's something about it that is distinct because, you know, we don't want to be told, become Christian so you can enjoy a perpetual retreat because nobody wants to give their life to a resort, you know. Um, you want to give your life to something that places demands on you, that places genuine claims on you, which asks you to sacrifice. And that's just what the worship of God is. But we're also associated in a, a communion or a union with other individuals, some who have passed from this life and others who as yet remain. And to them, we appeal, you know, either in, in veneration of what God has done or to ask their intercession because God has made it such that we go to him together by our prayers, by our sacrifices, by our service. There's there's so many like other signs of of uh, the like the body of Christ and and our church and this unity that we have like even in the human body you know you have a immune response when your body is severed or it's is hurting somewhere your body like actually creates physical manifestations of going to the weak part of your body to help build that up i mean it's the same thing with with the saints it's like you know when you say we we worship saints it's like no, we we you know th they're part of our body. You know, <laughs> like this is That's a beautiful. We have Christ ahead, yeah, right. And 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 basically, this is the body that He's created. We didn't create it; He mm -hmm. created it. 
and it operates like a human body because <laughs> so even when you even you when you look at the description of albigensianism that the father you know gregory described before so like the the instrumentality of it is that there is a response of the mystical body in response to that heresy and you know mm. father gregory i got to say you they know the every now cells. and then they're the white blood cells yeah. exactly yeah. like the white blood cells but i i got to tell you every now and then delacross over here slips into some albigensian heretical uh, statements, so we might need you to come over here from Switzerland and uh, treat this guy. Yeah, that's why we laugh, because they actually know an Albigensian. <laughs> <laughs> you guys didn't do a good enough job. <laughs> He's not, he doesn't even know what that word I don't even, means. Yeah, I don't even know what it is. You guys are like playing with me because you want to elicit a response <laughs> like a body does. Defense, and I have no idea what I'm defending. <laughs> Better that way, somehow, mystically. <laughs> it's better that way. No, but like, you know, um, like, I mean, even even uh, uh, veneration of like, you know, when you see something happen in somebody's life and you're like, wow, glory to God. Like, this is like, this is an amazing, I mean, you see it all the time. You're a priest. You see this impact that Christ has in the sacraments and, and just, you know, through your priesthood that you've been consecrated to, you see this. Like, that is... And it's the work of God, right? It's mm-hmm. it's the work of God, and we're just the vessels, right, that He's using, and and in a communal nature, when you see that healing occur, right, and you're the vessel, right, that's the body. Yeah, like at medi- work. mediation, mediator, and and witness. Yeah, you know, it's like the the witness of God's power and the impact of the in in the spirit is just it's evident, you know, mm-hmm. and and God manifests His power. In, in, in spirit, you know, like St. Paul talks about it in the scriptures as well. It's like he doesn't come with persuasive words. You know, right. he's not coming with like, you know, this kind of worldly display of, of you know, political power. Like, no, it's it's spirit, yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's a there's a sense of mediation in that. Yeah. And I think what you said earlier about terms and stuff to say, oh, mediation. Well, there's one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. And then you use the word mediate and they're like, ha. You don't follow Christ's teaching. Mm-hmm. Father, which call no man father. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of hangups on these kind of biblical or, or scriptural terms that they don't have the context to really understand and interpret. And I think that's one of the final, I think, reasons to be Catholic and not just Christian is that there is a defined authority to make judgmental and prudential um assignments of specific interpretations. Because if you look at it, you know, our Christianity is split into so many different sects and denominations. And the Holy Spirit is a uniter and cannot lie. There is all, only truth. So how can two groups that claim to be inspired by the Holy Spirit hold different things? You're dividing the Holy Spirit, which is impossible and mm-hmm. contrary to its nature. Mm-hmm. So wouldn't Christ... And didn't Christ, in his wisdom, send the Holy Spirit to inspire his church and to protect a and give a proper authority to make these kinds of um, prudential judgments? <laughs> I mean, you even see it in the book of Acts with the, the first council of Jerusalem. You see it in the person and in the chair of St. Peter and of the Pope, that we do have a defined way to mediate, using that word, doctrinal differences so that there can be a visible and a unifying force to keep the body of Christ together. So having an authority in the church where it's not everybody's self-interpretation, I think is a sign, number one, of the character of the Holy Spirit working in it, but also a sign throughout history that has kept us together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another proof of why Catholicism is the one true faith Mm -hmm. and not a self-interpretive do whatever you want type of view mm-hmm. that so many people have. Yeah, Father Gregory, would you be willing to comment even further, uh, you know, to add on to what Sheila was just so wonderfully saying? Like, you know, there's there's so many hangups and in, in, in the scriptural warfare of, of sola scriptura and just kind of the blame game. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I um I'm not I'm not especially good at hosting conversations with people um, that I disagree with. What am I trying to say? I think I have better success talking to Catholics or talking to atheists because I have an even easier time finding common ground. When I talk to Protestants, I have a more difficult time finding common ground. That's not to say they're worse people. It's just to say that I haven't yet found the way by which of going about it. My experience is that, um, it's often best just to be kind of practical 
in your approach. I think it's good, for instance, when talking to a Protestant, you know that things could be contentious. I think it's good to pray. So if you're going to disagree about mediation, you can find out at the outset whether you believe enough in the mediation of our Lord Jesus Christ as to pray together. I've had conversations with people when I asked an individual to pray with me, and he said no, because I don't think that we address the same God. So I was like, okay, that's that's good to know. I did some fact finding and I found stuff out. Um, and and then it's also good, I think, so, something that I I have to insist upon is you know I can get. I can get pumped about the whole experience and I can get super contentious and I can imagine all the ways in which I'm going to perform argumentative jujitsu on whatever arguments are, are subsequently proposed. But I think that you have to start with the disposition. You know, some people call it humility. I wouldn't know what that is. I'm just too young and too proud to recognize it even from a distance, <laughs> um, but just like to, to, to want, yeah, like you said at the outset, you're not, you're not so much there to win, uh, you're there to commend the truth of the gospel, right? So to love the truth more than you love your own judgments or more than you love your own arguments uh, and to love the other person more than you love the experience of conquest or domination or whatever it is, you know, that makes you depart from that encounter with some, I don't know, sense of self-satisfaction. I think that like we have to think about it as a kind of uh, service or as a kind of, yeah, I'm thinking of the way that Socrates talked about arguments. He's, he spoke of himself as a kind of midwife of the truth, which is weird insofar as it involves him helping other people give birth to the truth. Uh, and yet it's not a bad image. I mean, our Lord talks about, you know, while you are yet in labor pains, it's just punishing. But afterwards, you'll have delivered a man into the world. Ho anthropos. It's like, let's go. Um, and so I think that, that that's the idea. You're of service to the person. You're of service to the individual against whom you find yourself ranged. So I think that, you know, just, just go in there hoping in a certain sense to lose, right? To lose the insistence on your own way or to lose the attachment that you have, um, you know, to kind of wielding the truth as a cudgel. And then, you know, to to find in that an opportunity to be of service. So yeah, that's the beginning of an answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you like those circuitous answers, one thing I'd tell you is that check out Father Gregory and the podcast that he does, Godsplaining. It is a God's real, it is, awesome. it's fantastic. Actually, it's Howard awesome. helped design the logo and some of the branding for it, our own Howard here, but uh, it's a really, it's a great podcast. And honestly, I mean, Father Gregory, you're so entertaining and it's such a, you know, a refreshing way to present these things that, you know, we, we, we've had enough people who kind of present it in the same way. Uh, it's, it's a podcast that I really enjoy, and I know a lot of people uh, love listening to. So if you go, and I'll make sure there's a link here so you can check out their YouTube channel and subscribe to all their things. But Father Greg, you also have a few uh, books out right now too, right? I do. Could um, you tell us a little bit about you change the titles on them at all? It seems, like you, <laughs> seems like you have an affinity for not, that. Not yet. I mean, exactly. in, a, in a couple of years, he's going to change the titles. So one of them's called Jesus, My Lovely Lord. The other one's called Jesus, My Snuggly Lord. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the most recent one is called Prudence. Choose Confidently, Live Boldly, um, which is about, you guessed it, prudence. Basically, it's about how to make decisions and abide by them. And then I wrote one with Matt Fred called Mary in Consecration with Aquinas. Those, those would be the two that would be the most most helpful. Other stuff that I've written, it's, it's just totally weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure there's links to those there. So if you want to check those out, uh, totally you can go to JesusOurSnugglyLord.com and, and, and learn more. <laughs> uh, Jesus Our Cuddly Lord, that one is, I think it's a 404 error. So you that's know, a dot org. That's a dot org. <laughs> <laughs> dot TV. <laughs> Gross. Dot CA. Awesome. Oh my God. So yeah, Father Gregory, we really appreciate you joining us all the way from Switzerland via the the internets. Um love to have you back on again. This was we had a lot of fun. This was super enjoyable. Yeah, yeah it was an my joy. Thanks class. for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, for sure. Well, Father Gregory, what a joy. And to our friends and our listeners online, make sure that you're following these links in our show notes. Go to catholictalkshow.com. You'll see the show notes for this particular show and all the ways that you could follow us. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And for our patrons out there, thank you for your support financially of the show. If you're considering financially supporting the show, ensuring that this content goes into this next generation, 
Go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash Patreon, and we've got some cool gear to send your way. Coffee cups, hoodies, and essential oils from our buddies at Everything Catholic. <laughs> so Take God bless easy. you, and we'll see you next week. Yeah.